Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. In this episode, Greg interviews Dr. Lindsey Eberman and Dr. Matthew Rivera, both of Indiana State um, Athletic Training, uh, working looking at the DAT program uh, as Dr. Lindsey Eberman is the program director, but both um, being hugely involved, um, Dr. Eberman in the founding of the Clinical AT Journal and Dr. Rivera uh, currently being the managing, managing editor. So Greg talks a lot to them about that, how they got it started, what the importance of that is, um, and how that process works along with the DAT program and what that means if you follow on Twitter at all. Indiana State DAT is all over the place all the time doing a really good job getting everybody engaged, promoting the profession and what they do at Indiana State. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. Please check them out as you get ready for next year's bid and supply purchases. Enjoy this episode. This episode of Athletic Training Chat, um, we have some awesome uh, guests for you today. We have Dr. Everman and Dr. Rivera. They um, are both affiliated with Indiana State University. So our topics today are going to be on the Clin AT Journal that they run and the DAT program as well. So I'll kind of turn things over to you guys and let you uh, kind of introduce yourself, maybe give a little background. Great. My name is Lindsay Eberman. I'm a faculty member at Indiana State and I have been a faculty member here for uh, a little over 12 years. I have um, had the opportunity to run our professional programs as well as our post-professional programs and most recently our DAT program, which we've had here at ISU for five years. We are the only accredited DAT program in the country um, and have uh, cohorts of about 25 students per semester. Um, and so we have uh, a relatively large program as well. Um, I currently serve as the editor in chief and co-founder of the Clin AT Journal. And this is a journal we started just a few years ago. Um, and we can talk about how that came to be in just a few minutes. Um, I started in this role uh, in the last year um, mostly because we had decided that we really wanted to maintain um, senior author editorial relationships uh, with ISU faculty and or alum. And so that's who you'll see uh, assume the senior editorial staff positions. Um, in addition, we also welcome uh, clinicians primarily to serve as um, section editors throughout our journal. Um, and part of the reason for that is a, a strong emphasis on clinical practice as, as part of the journal's focus. I did my undergraduate work at uh, Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, and then traveled south to Miami, Florida, where I did my um, master's degree and PhD at Florida International University. My clinical practice experience is in secondary schools, as well as some experience in the college and university setting. And then at ISU, we've had the opportunity to develop and deliver patient care to the tactical athlete patients as well. Oh, awesome. Quite a wide range there. Uh, Dr. Rivera, do you want to give background? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thanks for having us on today. I um, just really appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, with you guys. Um, so I'm uh, Matt Rivera. I am also a faculty member at Indiana State University. Uh, I teach within the, the doctor and athletic training program as well. Uh, I'm originally from Southern California. I did my uh, professional program at Chapman University. Um, and then upon graduation from there, I uh, made the venture to Terre Haute, Indiana um, and started in the DAT program. I was a, a graduate assistant uh, working in a, a rural secondary school setting uh, while I was a DAT student. And uh, that's kind of where my interest and my passion for practice-based research really started to grow, uh, where I started seeing how uh, 
clinicians can actually be the front line of scholarship as well, uh, where they can implement evidence into their practice and collect those outcomes. And so that's kind of where my interest in, in PBR started. And so when I graduated uh, from the DAT program, I uh, started my PhD at Indiana State in curriculum and instruction with a concentration in athletic training education. And uh, while I was a graduate assistant for a year in my PhD program, that's when I assumed the role of managing editor for uh, clinical practice and athletic training, seeing the uh, day-to-day operations and the kind of big picture items for the journal and making sure the submissions were coming in and the peer review process was occurring. Um, And then over the summer last year, I actually assumed uh, a full-time faculty role uh, at Indiana State. Uh, So this is my first year. Um, in full-time faculty life uh, within the program. Um, As I mentioned, uh, my experience is in practice-based research and translation of evidence to practice, so that's kind of where my expertise is in, Um, and specifically with interventions and and manual therapies. That's the content that I teach within the DAT program as well. So, Wow, very cool. So both of you guys have quite a few uh, leadership and kind of higher-up roles, so... It's very nice to get to discuss that with you guys. Um, so I guess starting off with the first question for you, um, how did you start the Clin AT Journal? So it's really interesting. I would say several years ago, we were continuing to have conversations about the lack of clinical applicability of some scholarship in athletic training. And that's not to criticize any of the other journals. But we understand that their focus is on serving the academic community in terms of ensuring that we have a high impact factor and that the articles uh, uphold the strongest rigor. But one of the things is that we weren't seeing enough practice-based research within those journals and we were not seeing clinicians engaged in scholarly activities or partnering with researchers to engage in scholarly activities. And that's not to say there was none, but it just was not assuming a majority of of the journals that we see in athletic training. And instead of waiting for the world to, you know, deliver on that hope and expectation, we decided to take it upon ourselves to, uh, to do it ourselves. Uh, We asked for institutional support for startup funds to uh, sponsor a graduate assistant to serve in the managing editor role. And that was first assumed by Dr. Zach Winkleman, who is uh, currently being elevated to our senior editorial staff uh, within within ClinAT. He's a faculty member at uh, University of South Carolina and an alum of the uh, PhD program at ISU, as well as the master's program. And so he really did a lot of the legwork early on in uh, the journal development in terms of ensuring that we had um, all of our ducks in a row to make sure that we were indexed and that um, people were able to access our uh, access our journal in a reasonable way. Um, It is important for us that it is open access so making sure that we had a reasonable review platform and the infrastructure to deliver the journal through institutional resources which were at no cost to us so so that was pretty great to have him working through that in the first several months Um, and I think the goal was just to make sure that we had a journal that was accessible to clinicians you won't necessarily see uh, variables controlled in the studies that we that we print and publish. But what we want is for clinicians to be engaged in the collection of information in their practice, the analysis of that information, and then making decisions based on that information. And when they do that, sharing that and disseminating that with other clinicians, because the findings might not be generalizable to everyone but what they do is help set a model for how you might do something in your practice and inform how you might might make decisions based on your own population data collection awesome yeah that's very unique and uh definitely a place for that in the in the research world um did you have any initial challenges when you were setting that up or even things that still kind of challenge you now I mean, I think it's always going to be a challenge. Encouraging clinicians to engage in scholarship is, is going to be a challenge. We really want uh, clinician-scholar partnerships. This is a message we're hearing from the NATA and the Athletic Training Research Agenda Task Force. 
this is something that we're trying to embrace as a profession. And so I really, I want clinicians to believe that engaging in scholarship is not complex. It's not overly sophisticated, that it doesn't always have to come with barriers of IRB applications. I think that we want to make it so that people understand that the, the way they make decisions in practice can inform others. And that doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be complicated. It, it, what we do in our practice can inform others and the act of dissemination is, um, is gifting to the rest of the athletic training community. Sure. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Um, um, I think, uh, as uh, Dr. Everman's talking about trying to get uh, more clinicians engaged in scholarship, I think one of the ways that we've tried to overcome that challenge or that uh, potential obstacle is the uh, manuscript types that we offer in ClinAT are uh, very clinically focused and very um, direct, if you will. So um, the introductions and the conclusions don't require a robust literature review. It's more about the actual application of evidence into practice and the collection of those outcomes and how clinicians are making decisions based on the data that they are collecting. And so we've really tried to um, kind of minimize that stigma of quote unquote research, uh, what people might think that is, and really try to demonstrate what that translation of evidence actually looks like. Oh, very cool. So what is it like editing for the journal now? For either um, well, uh, that's a, a interesting question there. Um, so uh, we are a, a, a double blind peer review um, uh, at publication where uh, authors will submit uh, their manuscripts and it's initially reviewed by uh, one of the editorial staff to make sure it, it meets the, the mission and vision of the journal and meets the, just the manuscript guideline um, expectations. And then it's de-identified and, and um, sent to the section editors who um, most of our section editors are actual clinicians as well who are actively treating patients um, because we, again, want to make sure that we are having a clinical applicability in all of the uh, manuscripts that we are publishing. And so most of our clinicians are uh, clinicians who are um, actively treating patients. And so they will receive uh, the manuscript from that point and they will select reviewers um, to, to review the articles and, and um, provide that, that peer review. Um, it, from a standpoint of what is it like editing, it's a lot of just staying on top of the submissions and ensuring that that peer review process occurs as smoothly as possible. Um, the peer review process is, is a service to the profession. And so a lot of times it may not be one of the um, uh, top priorities for, for, individuals. And so sometimes it may take some prompting, but, um, it, it is, uh, um, you know, we greatly appreciate all of our reviewers and our section editors for the service that they provide to, um, continue this translation of evidence to practice. Um, but you know, it's, it's a team approach and making sure that we all can do what we can to make sure that those submissions are, um, going through that peer review process. And then once they actually are accepted, then it's just about, organizing them and getting a, an issue ready for publication. Um, right now we are publishing three times a year. Um, this first issue of the year comes out in the springtime. We're getting ready for our, our publication to come out in the next couple of weeks here. And then we have one in the summertime around NATA late June, early July. And then we have our, our last issue of the year comes out late October, early November. So we are on a spring summer fall publication timeline. Um, usually we have anywhere from five to seven um, articles from each of the different uh, manuscript types or guidelines that we have within each of those uh, issues. And so um, that's kind of a snapshot of what it's like to, to manage the journal at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're still in our going on our third year of, of publication. And so we're still smaller, but we are growing and we're seeing that definitely in the number of submissions that we're getting. Um, so it's, it's been a pleasure to serve and to be able to do this at this point. 
I think one of the things we're really trying to emphasize is, and you've heard us say it a couple times now, right? We're, we're bringing in section editors that are clinicians. We try to make sure that our reviewers are, are active clinicians. And so one of the things we're starting to institute this year is creating additional staff editors. And these individuals will support our section editors to make sure that the review process moves uh, at, in a timely manner, but also that they're supported to, to do some of the technical things. Like we really understand uh, how busy clinicians can get. And so making the process uh, s seamless and um, making sure that the, the review process can move through in a timely manner without feeling like an additional burden. The clinician should be providing feedback on the quality of the research and how it can positively impact clinical practice and not these technical things that sometimes slow down the, the review process and, and the uh, publication process. Sure. Yeah, that seems uh, you guys definitely have a, a good system going and hopefully uh, more articles will come in for you to, you know, keep uh, increasing your, your audience. Hopefully we can help with that as well. Um, you guys just did a great job explaining it. So um, hopefully our audience can get some submissions in. So uh, last question about the journal, I guess. What would you say is the importance of having a practice-based research journal? I mean, I would have to say Dr. Rivera is the expert on practice-based research, but I certainly know he got the message from somewhere. Um, obviously, we emphasize that as part of the doctoral program. People need to be assessing their own practice. They need to be gathering data in their own practice, and they need to be using that data to drive decisions. And so the purpose of a practice-based research journal, the reason why we need them is one, to model these kinds of practices. Unfortunately, they're not common in athletic training. And what we need is for people to see, this is how you do this. This is how people can make decisions based on the data they collected. And this is how it positively impacted patient care. And until we have a large volume of scholarship in athletic training, regardless of the journal, that directly informs clinical practice, then people are not going to do that kind of work as part of what they do as a clinician. And so we really believe the value of having a journal like this is creating the image for people that being a scholarly clinician is doable. Yeah, I think that last part about the idea of it being doable is kind of what sparked my interest when I was um, a graduate assistant. And primarily because as I was um, learning about, because I was a new clinician in the DAT program, learning how to be an evidence-based clinician, um, one thing that I continued to struggle with was things that I tried to implement from the evidence lacked a um, translatability uh, because it was very disease oriented and very heavily focused on the actual science. And if we think about evidence-based practice and the three pillars of evidence-based practice, there's also the clinician experience and also the patient perspective as well. And so I think, you know, uh, continuing on with what Dr. Evan was saying, the other importance of it is, and what we are trying to do is give the clinicians and the patients both a voice in scholarship to help disseminate that to other clinicians who may be experiencing similar challenges or um, treating similar patient panels and, and that sort of thing. So as I mentioned, you know, our manuscript types are, are geared towards clinicians um, and the writing is geared towards clinicians, but we also have the opportunity for clinicians to include patient perspectives in some of the manuscript types as well. So not only um, you know, how did clinicians make decisions, but what was the patient's experience in the delivery of care uh, for their case themselves? How, what did the patient think? How did they feel during that, um, you know, plan of care or whatever that might be as well to also hit on all three pillars of evidence-based practice to help other clinicians understand how this evidence is actually translating and, and what that might look like for them as well. Wow. Very cool. I, that's the first thing I noticed when I, um, kind of discovered your journal was that you do include those um, kind of those patient um, objective measures and stuff. And it's, it's very cool to hear that because, you know, a lot of evidence-based journals, they, um, they either can't put that in there or they, they choose not to. And it's just, uh, it's nice to hear their perspective of things because um, each patient's going to be obviously unique in how they respond to things. And 
um, you know, I, I think it's just a, a really good idea to really include all those aspects like you were just saying. Um, definitely clears things up and gives people a, a better way to make their decisions. Yeah, I mean, it really lends to the disablement model, which we should, you know, the NATA and our profession has embraced for several years now. Our journal is really built around the idea that the patient is a whole person and that we're not focused on disease oriented evidence. And so you'll see that throughout all of the journal type or the article types. Um, and patient rated outcome measures are not an accessory measure. They are the, the focus they are the way that we listen and gather feedback from patients. And um, all of our journal, or, or many of our manuscript uh, types really focus in on the feedback from patients. Oh, awesome. All right, so kind of to segue into um, our other topic today, can you guys tell me about the DAT program at Indiana State University? Absolutely. So the DAT at ISU is um, started in 2015. We, um, we had been talking about the DAT for some time and uh, due to typical academic and institutional barriers where uh, we got approved by the state um, in December 2014. I can actually remember that moment um, because uh, when we did the minute that we did, they said, so you can start in June, right? And so we had already started recruiting for the master's program at the time. And we went from a 36 or 37 credit master's degree program to a 57 credit um, doctoral degree program. The structure content uh, degree expectations were drastically different. And so we had to work pretty uh, quickly to um, implement the new program. Our inaugural class graduated in spring or May 2017, and we've had six, uh, 60 students graduate from the program, three classes so far. Uh, we'll have another 21, 22 students here graduate in, in May. Um, we are a continuous enrollment full-time program. Uh, many of the other DATs have chosen some part-time enrollment, um, and that certainly works for a particular kind of student. One of the strengths um, that both we as a faculty believe the students have indicated and our alum have indicated, and now at this point, the external accreditors have indicated our cohort style is a really successful approach to delivering a, a doctoral degree. And so we do like the, the full-time cohort style approach to our program delivery. And we've certainly discussed what other alternatives might be available, but at this time we are a full-time enrollment cohort style program. So students start in, the, in June um, and they start as one single cohort. Uh, semesters range from about nine credits to 11 credits per semester. In the fall and spring, students are engaged in clinical education courses. This is an expectation of the external accreditor, the Katie. Um, in those courses, the expectation is that students are engaged in clinical work, and this can be their full-time employment or a, through a graduate assistantship. Um, and the intention there is that they're integrating the things they've been learning throughout the program into their clinical practice. So the clinical education courses re-emphasize um, and allow students to apply concepts directly into practice and then uh, measure those outcomes. <clears throat> and the program also uh, has three points of distinctiveness, advocacy, education, and leadership. And so there's a series of courses that really focus on those particular skills. Uh, integrative healthcare, which includes uh, nine credits of manual therapy, which our students find develop uh, advanced manual therapy skills for them, um, as well as really looking at whole person healthcare in terms of prevention, diagnosis, and intervention. And then the other piece, as we've discussed relative to the journal, is the emphasis of measuring outcomes in your practice and using that data to drive decisions. And so those are our kind of key areas that we try to focus on in our program. We do include, uh, a, it's, kind of, it's a distance hybrid program, so students are taking the courses online and then they come to campus for four to five days at the end of every semester. We try to coordinate it so it's about the last two weeks or the last week of the semester. And so there are a lot of culminating activities and they range from labs 
to presentations, to simulations and standardized patients. And we use a wide variety of pedagogical strategies during those sessions to ensure students are engaged the entire time. If you talk to our students, they would say it's like NATA on steroids in terms of they have lots of options. We have one whole DAT weekend where they actually, um, we have dual programming. So depending on what, cor what courses they're in, they may be able to attend um, whatever they choose or they have specific programming uh, directed toward the learning outcomes of, the, of their classes. Um, and these times that they come to campus are, I think our students would tell you that that's the most valuable um, time where they get to solidify themselves as a cohort, but it also just allows them to, to really hammer down on all the things they learned over the course of the semester. So we do have a unique program delivery style. Uh, it is different than any of the other programs that are available. We um, are a small faculty. We have three faculty with two PhD students to support our program. And um, we love what we do. This is probably the coolest job I've ever had. Um, and a lot of people ask me like, if I would wanna do something different. And I just, we just have such latitude to think big and th think creatively about delivering a doctoral program. It's part of, you know, post-professional accreditation allows us to have some of that latitude to emphasize faculty strengths and to, to uh, deliver a program beyond the healthcare core competencies. But we just, we just have a field day on thinking about creative ways to teach and also ensuring that our content is on the cutting edge of healthcare. Wow, awesome. Yeah, I think if I can add just from a student perspective uh, from uh, being a graduate of uh, ISU's DAT program, one of the things that I think um, also uh, stands out for the curriculum that we deliver at ISU is the leadership component and uh, mostly through um, self-development as uh, or we call it personal development as professional development. And so we believe that in order to be uh, an effective leader, um, whether that is in an actual leadership position with an actual title or just leading uh, in the position that you are in and leading those around you, the first step is actually understanding yourself and developing yourself individually um, to become that leader. And so we do have a, a heavy emphasis on that. And I think that's one of the, one of the other strengths of our program, uh, just from a, from an alumni perspective, speaking about the program that I think sets us apart as well. And, and that's unique to our program. Awesome. Um, would you say that that's, um, besides the leadership then, what are some other advantages to get in your DAT? So our students often graduate and indicate that they are, that the program has been a career accelerator. So they finish the program and somewhere they thought they'd be in 10 years comes to them much quicker. Um, which I think, uh, I think for, for young professionals, the idea that they're part of the conversation and engaged in decision making makes, uh, jo creates job fulfillment. I think when we look at the, um, the national statistics relative to, uh, right now we're looking at millennials and, and a little bit of Gen Zers in the job market in that young professional range mm -hmm. and we see that they often change jobs because they don't feel engaged or not fulfilled by the work and one of the things that we emphasize in terms of this personal and professional development is understanding your core values and then making sure your workplace and your environment match the things that are important to you so people are better matching themselves to the jobs that they're in and so they are often more fulfilled by the work because they have made an intentional choice to engage in that work and because they are considered equal and essential contributors to the workplace. And I think we're seeing that more and more now in that a lot of our alum have been considered essential employees within this COVID-19 experience. They are seen as leaders and people who are able to deliver things like telemedicine, patient education, staff education, to ensure that the, the hospital systems and healthcare organizations are still functioning and working. And our DEIT students and alum are at the front edge of that. And I think that's we obviously get student feedback all the time, but that's been a really resounding message in the last couple of weeks. And that's made us feel 
like what we had envisioned for the program is really being executed upon graduation. Well, so I guess both of you are faculty at um, ISU. I guess I'll start with Dr. Rivera. Uh, what is it like um, kind of teaching and being part of the ClinAT um, review? Yeah, I, I mean, Dr. Everman said this earlier, but I mean, I, I at this point, I don't want any other job. This has been the uh, best nine months of my life since August, since I got this uh, full time job. It's been a it's been a crazy transition to go from graduate assistant to full time faculty in uh, the span of what was about two and a half weeks. But um, wow. I think that um, the the atmosphere and the the working environment that we've created at Indiana State. Uh, to be so collaborative um, has been a huge advantage and the opportunity to get to interact with and teach some of the most um, amazing students and, and brilliant students um, that just want to be challenged and, and have a growth mindset has been um, something that I, you know, I had been around as a graduate assistant, but now actually being a faculty member have actually gotten to enjoy completely. And so um, I think from a, from an actual faculty perspective, it's, it's, it's been a blessing because it, again, with this transition and all of these changes going on with the COVID-19 situation, um, we've been delivering online education for a while now. And so we've been actually able to help influence, um, and, and support other, uh, educators and programs, uh, through our experiences. Um, it's funny. I was talking to some, some individuals the other day and I was like, well, I don't know if I'm an expert in this, but I can tell you what didn't work for me and hopefully that will help you. Um, but I think that's another unique opportunity from, from a perspective of the position that I have here in the United State with uh, teaching online. Um, and then from just a, from a Clint AT standpoint, um, you know, again, we are a younger journal, but to be able to see how this journal has um, grown in just the past three years, um, where we have been able to exhibit at some of the different conferences and uh, been able to uh, be in the same conversation as some of the, some of the other larger outlets in our profession um, has been a joy and been a, you know, a blessing as well. So. Oh, very cool to hear. Um, how about you, Dr. Everman? Uh, since you are the program director, I will ask you, uh, what is that like for a DAT program? Well, I think the one thing that I will always remember at my core is that I'm always going to be a faculty member first and a program director second, in that my job is to make sure that students are learning, engaged, excited about what they're learning, which every class I teach is should be hyper-focused around my enthusiasm for the content and getting them to be equally enthusiastic about what we're learning. Um, that, to me, is uh, is the most joyful part of being a faculty member and a teacher, getting people excited about the same things that you're excited about. When students ask for additional sessions or want to talk more, that tells me that they've caught the, the bug that we have as a, as a faculty, and that makes me really proud of their um, attachment to lifelong learning and the excitement about continuing beyond graduation. We talk a lot about benchmarks and uh, program completion and all of that is important from an accreditation standpoint and a program director standpoint and a university uh, outcome standpoint, but all of our students know that graduation is just a new start line. It's not finishing anything, but it's starting something new. And so that's, that's really, I think, uh, a cool part of being an educator. Um, we often talk about uh, the personalities of our faculty and uh, most everybody knows Dr. Games. He's our third faculty member. We often joke that he's sometimes uh, in a rocket ship to Mars or, or uh, trying to land on the moon. And sometimes as the program director, it's my job to figure out how to get everybody to the airport or even on the plane, uh, never mind flying the plane and, uh, and or leaving orbit. And so um, sometimes as a program director, that can be challenging because what you're balancing is aspirational and practical. 
And so sometimes our students come to us early on in the program and they don't have great foundational knowledge or they've struggled to learn simple concepts like evidence-based practice or the core competencies in general. They continue to say things like athlete instead of patient. They uh, show possession over their patients, right? My patients. And those are habits we try to break pretty early. Uh, but when we are on Mars or on the moon, sometimes we don't end up speaking the same language. And so my job is to help balance that and help create a curriculum that allows somebody to go from getting on the plane to taking off to Mars when they graduate. And that, that can be uh, fun but challenging as a program director. I really am an education geek. I love uh, curriculum design and uh, thinking about creative ways to uh, engage students. And I do that obviously from a faculty perspective, but also from a program director perspective when we plan our DAT weekends and our focus intensive learning sessions. That's a collaborative environment where we get to think about really cool ways to teach and learn in a face-to-face -face way and how to connect that to the online learning that they've already been engaged in. And so my role as program director is to try to create those meaningful learning experiences and support the faculty who want to do fun and creative um, and exciting and new and not done before um, learning activities. I think uh, all of the faculty are pretty disappointed that we're not able to do our DAT weekends this spring because we were really unveiling quite a few new and exciting learning opportunities and we're having to modify to the online environment. And as Dr. Rivera said, we do have some experience here, which I think's given us an advantage because we are still able to offer some of the really cool things that we were hoping to do face to face. We'll be doing those things online. Awesome. Yeah, I can, uh, I can definitely tell why your program's so successful when you guys are all so passionate and, um, you know, I'm hoping to get Dr. Games on a, on an episode as well, because I know that he can, uh, you know, talk for days. So I that think is he true. Able. He can do that. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll jump into our AT chat five questions here. So where do you see athletic training going in the next five to 10 years? Well, I'm super hopeful that we are uh, seen as essential healthcare providers in the next five to 10 years. I had wished we were here by now. Um, and with the number of layoffs and the number of um, individuals in athletic training who are struggling to show themselves as essential, we need to think of ourselves as healthcare providers who serve the sports industry instead of members of the sports industry. And I think that to me will be the turning point for our profession. I've been disheartened uh, lately in terms of athletic trainers who may have been practicing for a long time who don't see uh, a positive future for athletic training, but I'm lucky to be surrounded by some really excellent healthcare providers, uh, clinical specialists, uh, directors of athletic training services, true leaders in the profession, and they are delivering high quality healthcare. And I will continue to surround myself with those kinds of people because that's what I see in the future. Awesome. How about you, Dr. Rivera? Yeah, I think uh, to summarize my thoughts, it's that we are no longer athletics, but we are healthcare. And that's it in a nutshell, is just that we are seen as, as actual healthcare providers and um, are not only seen as healthcare providers, but are doing the same things that other healthcare providers are doing, collecting outcomes, uh, quality improvement, demonstrating value, actually making decisions based on data rather than just how my preceptor had done it. Um, and so I think that shift comes with, you know, a growth mindset shift and, and a, not a fixed mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what advice would you give yourself as a young athletic trainer? Have humility and be vulnerable. I was a confident young athletic trainer. I think part of that came from my training. I really loved my experience at Northeastern University. It, it doesn't quite exist. Well, athletic training at Northeastern doesn't exist anymore, but athletic training relative or connected to a cooperative education program uh, is not very common in our profession. And so for every clinical experience any one of my peers had, I had twice as many because I was engaged in cooperative education in alternating semesters. 
And so what that did was give me a lot more patient encounters and clinical experiences. If I think about how that translates to the new clinical education model that's being uh, suggested by the Katie, it means get your students more immersive experiences, get them more opportunities to make decisions. And what that'll do is develop confidence. But what you have to do is balance that with humility, vulnerability, and self-reflective -reflect practice. And so I think those are the things I would tell my younger self, being more self-reflective, thinking and evaluating um, errors in my own care and being patient-centered from the perspective of always remembering that the patient came first, not sport, not necessarily school, but that the patient, the whole person comes first. Yeah, well said. Uh, for me, it would be um, to give myself some grace and I'm still learning how to do that now. Um, I feel like every time I transition into a new role, I have to continue to learn that. Um, but for me, I uh, really wanted to be a perfection. I mean, I am a perfectionist, but I really wanted to do everything perfectly and the best of my abilities. And um, some of these roles that I've been uh, fortunate enough to be placed into, I may have not had the most traditional route to these roles. And so I start to compare myself to others where I may think I'm not as well trained or that I am not actually suited for this role when in reality I am. And I am lucky enough to have the people around me that I do to remind me of that. But when I feel like I don't measure up, I can tend to beat myself up about that. And so just making sure that I, even as a young professional that I am right now, just continuing to give myself grace and understanding that you know, nobody is perfect and that we all have our different strengths that make us unique. Yeah, for sure. I like that. Um, so what has been the most influential resource that you guys have found in your careers? You want to go first? You want me to? Uh, so I, I have two. Um, one of them is just um, other individuals. So um, really, you know, we have a group office where all of the faculty and all the PhD students are in the same space every day. And so this whole work from home thing has really thrown us off. But um, we have created, like I mentioned earlier, we created this, this space where we're collaborative in pretty much almost everything we do. And so that's actually been the greatest influence or resource in my career. But I don't know if it's a, if it's a specific resource, but the other one I was going to mention is just I really notice that the times that I'm growing the most is when I'm reading the most. And that's not from, uh, from a athletic training standpoint, but from a, a personal development standpoint. So finding books outside of athletic training that are growing me as an, as a human and as an individual, that's when I have noticed some of the most influential growth in my career. Wow. Well. So I let Dr. Rivera go first, knowing that we were going to say the exact same thing, but absolutely people and books. Um, we say all the time, leaders are readers. And so making sure that you're engaged in literature well outside of athletic training. To be fair, when I was a doctoral student, I didn't read anything except for pedagogical research, which can be dry and lengthy. Uh, but even now, I actually like reading some of that stuff. But I, I would definitely say personal uh, development, understanding the ethics of medicine. Um, I've read one really uh, good book in the last year that was, uh, it's called The Fifth Risk from Michael Lewis. And it does have a political spin, but specifically it just talked about preparedness and thinking about how, how responsible we are to have some foresight and some forecasting about what the future might look like. Um, and I think about how that, that might be helpful to us even in this moment. Um, but yes, leaders are readers. Books are books are power. They, I, I'm gonna age myself. But if you if you remember, there's a very critical scene from the movie Goodwill Hunting, uh, where you know he talks about how a Harvard degree is one thing, but the public library can teach you just as much if you simply choose to engage in those resources. And so I think that um, reading is super critical. Uh, we all have a, a general book challenge or a reading challenge in the office, but what happens is we read stuff and then just add it to Dr. Rivera's <laughs> pile and he says he can't keep up because we just keep adding. It's not very fair. 
but I've been really lucky to also have, I, I agree with Dr. Rivera relative to collaboration, but I've been blessed with some of the greatest mentors in athletic training, people who see light in me and wisdom in me. And all it, they have done is uh, fuel that. And I've been really, really blessed to have those kinds of people because not only have they fueled me, but they've given me the opportunity to learn what good mentorship looks like and offer that to other people as well. Oh, very cool. All right. So next one for you guys, if you could change or eliminate one thing in the field of athletic training, what would it be? Um, it can be modality, common practice, even a mindset that people have. Um, this one's definitely open for interpretation. So if I said all modalities, <laughs> I do think that we overuse mechanical modalities so that there's not enough evidence to support their use. And so I really believe in manual therapy and exercise as uh, reasonable interventions that actually yield better outcomes for patients. And they um, often include um, active participation and feedback from patients um, where sometimes putting a modality on a patient is, uh, doesn't... Um, we often do it out of habit. We don't change the course of our treatment if we've been using it for two weeks and the outcome hasn't changed. Like if a patient is coming up to us for their sixth month treatment of ice and e-stim, we're doing something wrong because we haven't figured out that the e-stim is helping in any particular way. Um, but I would also, I, and I think Dr. Rivera will agree with this, um, a fixed mindset, people that don't believe that there's a future to our profession or they don't see that every in interaction is a learning opportunity, every failure is a learning opportunity. One of my uh, common things that I teach the student, students is when they join our program, we talk a lot about education and you might hear people say, well, I didn't, I didn't join a DAT because I want to be a professor. Well, we didn't make a DAT because we wanted to make professors. But every interaction is an educational opportunity. This conversation right here is an educational opportunity. So being a, a, a positive influence, being prepared and having information and sharing that information in a meaningful way is a form of education. So thinking that every opportunity is an opportunity to change somebody's mind, to influence them, to share information. You know, sometimes in athletic training, we get our you know, the chip on our shoulder that people don't know what athletic trainers do. That's an educational opportunity. Instead of thinking it as a victim mentality, people don't understand me, changing that perspective and really focusing on that as a learning, a, a learning opportunity. Let me tell you all the things that I could do to help you or your patient or your, your child. Uh, it's a huge, huge place for us to shift our thinking and really be engaged in a growth mindset. Yeah, yeah, great answers. Um, how about you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, anything I, to add? I, I was going to say, I think it's the, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily eliminate, but it's definitely change is um, an empowerment for every athletic trainer. So, um, and what I mean by that is uh, an extension of what Dr. Evan was saying from a victim mentality, but instead of, um, you know, thinking about, well, I can only do X, Y, and Z with so much time, or I can only do this or that because I have so many people coming in after school to see me. Changing that from I can only to I get to, um, and watching how that simple shift in language can empower somebody to actually change their practice. Um, and specifically, I think this comes out a lot in our program. And when I talk to students is, the idea of how we see our time in our practice. So instead of, I can't do X, Y, and Z because I have so many people coming in after school, I get to do X, Y, and Z. And that X, Y, and Z will actually change to be, maybe it's more efficient or effective modalities or, or rehab exercises or interventions or whatever that might be. But I think it comes to that fixed mindset and, and being empowered to take ownership of your own practice, which then, can build into ownership of what your role is in athletic training and, and healthcare in general. Awesome. Uh, so last one for you guys, what does being an athletic trainer mean to you? So um, when I, when I think about this question, I think about um, 
something that I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Games, actually the, our third faculty member a few years ago when I was still figuring out what it meant to me. And I remember saying like that I did not get into this profession for me. I got into this to help serve others. And I think um, at times that can get lost, especially when we talk about some of the things that we've been talking about today from the idea of um, difficult situations. But um, to me, it means I have the opportunity to influence and inspire others. Um, what that role looks like may be different from it shifted from being an actual clinician to now more of a faculty role. Um, but it, it gives me a platform to help others find what inspires them and what lights them on fire um, to just be positive influences. Awesome. I think being an athletic trainer to me means being the preferred provider, particularly for um, underserved populations and young people. I think that right now the greatest potential for growth in athletic training, I hope, is in youth sports, secondary school, athletic training service, and underserved populations, particularly some of the emerging settings. But athletic training has, uh, has the potential to help bridge the gap between the formal healthcare system and the ways we engage in activity in life. And so I think um, I want to see being an athletic trainer as being that bridge or being that conduit for people and helping them navigate the healthcare system and being a patient advocate uh, as they may or may not need to access uh, healthcare beyond uh, what maybe I might be able to offer in a community-based clinic or in uh, my athletic training facility. So that's what I'd like. I, that's what I see as being an athletic trainer is really being a patient advocate and helping them navigate the healthcare system and, and bridging that gap. Yeah, those, those are very good points. Um, well, thank you guys for joining me today. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we uh, kind of part ways? I just want to say thank you again. We, we're, we really appreciate the opportunity. We believe in what we're doing uh, with the DAT, but also with ClinAT. And we hope that um, both serve as an opportunity for people who see themselves as leaders in the profession to engage in their own particular way. Yeah, well, uh, we appreciate you as well. Uh, it's been very fun talking to you guys. Um, I am going to put your guys' Twitter handle uh, when we post this. Is there any other way to get a hold of you that you would like um, kind of out there? Uh, I know I have your ISU athletic training Twitter and your ClinAT journal Twitter. Um, generally, we kind of stick to that, but it's definitely up to you guys if you want anything else on there. Yeah, I mean, Instagram too for both of those handles um, are on Instagram as well. So if people want to hop on Instagram. Yep. And then our emails are pretty easy to access, but all of the faculty have access to both our um, Indiana State uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram. And so you can access any of us that way. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah, that makes it easy. Um, I think it was a, a great episode. You guys touched on a lot of really important things and uh, definitely um, made it very clear what you guys do. And um, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, you guys are both very passionate and it was, it was really a pleasure hosting you guys. So I uh, just wanted to say thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.